previous um, topic that was discussed a few weeks ago, um, from my understanding, was a lot of controversy controversy over um, this certain subject, and a lot of people um, was texting and calling and asking, you know, um, if it could be brought back. At this time, we're going to turn it over into the panelists' hands in Jesus' name. It's in your hand, panelists. Uh, praise the Lord, everyone. So uh, the discussion that we uh, was planning to um, to have this evening pertained to um, tithes. And uh, just so that there's uh, clarity um, in the uh, understanding of it, um, we had hoped to revisit it after uh, having the discussion a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, we did have a few folks that would um, pull on our coattails afterwards and, and have questions. And so you know, we felt it was necessary to come back to this and um, and uh, try to uh, try to uh, bring an understanding uh, to folks' hearts. Uh, we do know that you know this is one of those topics that uh, has been uh, debated and will probably be debated. You know, even after we're long gone, uh, up until the rapture takes place, as to uh, the importance and the relevance of tithing uh, for the modern church age. And so. Um, uh, in the last discussion, uh, you know, some thoughts uh, were brought to the table, um, you know, um, but um, uh, we're hoping that, um, you know, by revisiting this, you know, everybody can very least, um, you know, uh, walk away feeling a little bit more uh, clear about the discussion. So uh, with that being said, um, I guess I will begin breaking up the bread. Uh, praise the Lord. Unless Stanley, you wanted to start. You go ahead, Elder Bonet. Okay. I'll let, I'll let the senior start, and you're much more senior than me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, if we look at uh, the scripture that was brought up last time, uh, the um, uh, the discussion uh, led us to uh, the uh, Bel to Melchizedek, and how uh, if you read in um, let me see if I can go there very, very quickly. Uh, but if you read in uh, verse number 14 of Genesis, uh, excuse me, chapter 14 of Genesis, beginning at 18 to 20. So I'll read to your hearing. And Melchizedek, uh, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, pertaining to Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham, Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed uh, and be and blessed be the most high God, uh, which have delivered thine enemies uh, into thy hand. And he pertaining to Abraham gave him tithes of all. And also, uh, if we were to look at uh, the book of Hebrews pertaining to Melchizedek, um, it says on this wise in verse number one of chapter seven for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, uh, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. And blessed him, uh, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, uh, which is king of peace. Uh, and then uh, it goes on and says, without father pertaining to Melchizedek, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but uh, made like unto the Son of God, abide of a priest continually. Now consider how great. This man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priest have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of the brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. And I'll stop right there for now. And so um, this is where the debate arises, um, you know, uh, pertaining to the modern day Christian. Um uh, they hang their hat. There are many who hang their hat on the fact that Abraham was a uh, a Bible person um, who uh, lived outside of law. Now, we do know that uh, the law in the law, it says that, you know, uh, Israel of the 11 tribes of Israel was to pay tithes of the land, of the goods of the land that they received, because now if you remember, uh, once Israel possessed the promised land in Canaan, uh, and uh, they uh, divided their people uh, accordingly. 
um, the only tribe of the uh, of the twelve that did not receive a portion of the land was Levi. And the reason why that is is because the Lord appointed Levi uh, to be uh, the priesthood uh, who would serve in the temple uh, and honor the Lord there. Uh, so the eleven tribes of the twelve received their inheritance by land, and so their land was their inheritance. Uh, and the Lord told Levi, the priesthood, he said, I am your inheritance. And so it was commanded by the Lord uh, to uh, to Israel that uh, Israel was to pay tithes, which was a tenth of their possession, tenth of their increase of their inheritance, which they received uh, from their land. Um, and they were to bring it into the house of the Lord. And the Lord would then take a portion of that and divide it amongst the Levites so that they would have something. Because remember, they didn't have land that they tilled. Uh, their occupation was to daily uh, you know, uh, work on the behalf of the Lord. Uh, and so this is where the tithing system as it pertains to the law comes into play. Now, we're no longer under the law. Uh, that's something that we do have to establish at first. And, and we all know that. Uh, you know, once the church was established in Acts chapter two, uh, the law ended and the age of grace uh, came into play. Now, uh, you had those such as the Apostle Paul who taught and was persecuted uh, for teaching this way that, uh, you know, uh, we are no longer under the law, but we're under grace. And that was hard for the Jews of that time. Many of the Jews, the uh, you know conservative Jews of that time. Uh, to to understand and wrap their heads around even the Christian Jews, uh, you know, or during that time had a hard time wrapping their head around uh, disannulling the law, uh, so to speak. Um, but Paul, by the spirit, was emphasizing that this is uh, we're no longer supposed to, uh, uh, you know, fulfill the law as was done during the Mosaic time. But now we fulfill the law by having Jesus in our heart. Uh, and allowing him to now write on the, not on stone slabs, uh, the law, but rather write on the fleshy heart of our person, the law. And so because now the law is a part of us, we don't have to work to fulfill it. We just naturally fulfill it because we have his spirit. And so uh, the question now is this, uh, what happens to tithing? Uh, is it old? Is it passe? Uh, a lot of folks uh, refuse to uh, to think that it is passe. And I will go on the record and say that, no, tithe still exists. But how we treat the tithes uh, has changed. And so uh, one of the reasons why this particular scripture was brought up was because, um, you know, many, uh, uh, you know, read into it and say that, well, you know, Abraham uh, was not under the law, just like we are not under the law. And because we're not under the law, like Abram is not under the law, uh, yet Abram still paid tithes unto Melchizedek, uh, who was the representation of Christ. And yes, that is very true. But uh, there's a few things that's that a lot of the folks who hang their hat on that scripture, there's a few things uh, that a lot of people uh, don't uh, take into consideration when they use that scripture. Um and I want to go over a few. OK, for one, when you look at the story of Abraham and Melchizedek, um, when Abraham offers or rather gives the tenths of his spoil from the the kings uh, after retrieving Lot, uh, who was a prisoner during the Battle of the Kings, when Abraham uh, gives Melchizedek a tenth of his spoil, he does so on his own accord. You never see anywhere in the scriptures where Melchizedek orders uh, Abraham to give him a tenth of the spoils. There's no commands. As a matter of fact, you don't even hear the voice of Melchizedek at all. Uh, it is just that he is recognized and he it is understood even by Abraham who this man is. And uh, if you really want to get deep about it, when you look at the, the reading of Hebrews and how it's introduced, how Melchizedek is introduced, he's not just uh, thrown into the scriptures haphazardly, but there is a structure uh, to Hebrews and, 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 and how he is placed within the story of the account of the Hebrew author. Um, when you open up Hebrews, he first goes into, uh, you know, who's the son of God is. 
who Jesus is, you know, uh, and how, uh, you know, important his words are for God, who in sundry times and in divers men has spoken times past by the prophets, having these last days spoken unto us by his son, by whom he made the worlds. OK, and then it goes on and speaks about Israel and their rest. And the reason why that is, is because now the author is saying, hey, you know, let's not repeat the problems and the, um, you know, the, the sins of those who who walked behind uh, the commands of God of old, the Israelites, when they walked in the wilderness, they didn't enter into the rest because they didn't believe in God. And so the Hebrew author is emphasizing the importance of following the son. He's emphasizing the importance of uh, doing so. Why? Because there is a rest unto the people of God. Then he goes on from there after promising the rest, after saying that this is you, you have to follow the rest uh, by faith. Then he begins to introduce Melchizedek. OK, and in introducing Melchizedek, now you're speaking about uh, praise the Lord, uh, um, you know, uh, I mean, it's almost like a timeline of sorts. And uh, if you look at the Hebrew account of Melchizedek and you go back to the Genesis account of Melchizedek, you can kind of see that timeline uh, taking place. Um, because if we go back to the Genesis account really quick, uh, before Melchizedek comes on the scene, there's a battle of the kings of the land. And uh, it's interesting because... Uh, this battle uh, was against uh, five kings against four kings. And uh, the five kings uh, that are uh, uh, of note with the actual five kings is where Lot falls into play. He was in the camp of the five kings. And so that meant that he was in the camp of the Sodomites. It goes on to read in Genesis 14, and it came to pass in the days of uh, Ampharel, uh, king of Shinar, Ariot, king of Eleazar, Cadolaramer, uh, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these may war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Beersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinad, king of Adma, and Shermember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. This is important. Why? Because it is a type and shadow of a, a battle of Armageddon. Okay? Um, uh, the cities of the plain is what uh is 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 where Sodom and Gomorrah existed. And so for a time, even myself, I was thinking, like, my goodness, why would they be spared, knowing that the scriptures have already said in Genesis 13 that the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. But if you if you move further into the scriptures, you'll see that when it comes to uh the battle of Armageddon that's going to take place much later there will be Gentile nations that will be saved. Why? Because of how they treated the Jews and also because of uh, the promises of old that the Lord made, such as Egypt will be saved. Uh, you know, um, you know, uh, you have Edom will be saved. So you have places that will be saved. And these are those who will help Israel because remember, Israel has been scattered. And uh, so they're all out in the world right now. And when the Antichrist sends forth his flood, uh, he's going to try to uh, kill off all of Israel. But the earth is going to help Israel by swallowing the flood. And so that's in reference to those nations that help Israel. And so if you look at the battle of the five of, of kings um, and you liken it to the battle of Armageddon, the aftermath of the battle of Armageddon will have these nations still standing along with, you know, uh, the people of God and represented by Lot. And so when you move into that account, the, the scriptures then speaks about how Abram rescued Lot. Uh, and then it goes on, it talks about how, uh, you know, it, which is interesting, Melchizedek appears in the portion of the scriptures where he's about to, where uh, Sodom is saying, hey, you know what, let's divide the spoils. You take this and I'll take that. But then Abram chooses not to go down that road. In fact, he rather chooses to give unto Melchizedek, who comes to him with bread and wine. This Melchizedek is the representation of Christ, who comes in bread and wine. And what he's doing is he's celebrating a type of Feast of Tabernacles, which takes place after uh, the Battle of Armageddon during the millennial reign of Christ. 
we will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, where we will have bread and wine and sit at the table of the Lord and sit with, you know, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all of these things. And if you know anything about the Feast of Tabernacles, it is the last feast of the Lord's year, the last celebratory feast of the Lord's year. And it is the most um, uh, it is the most celebrated of the feast of the seven feasts. Because what it represents is the bringing in of all of the fruits of the land. And so here, when an Israelite celebrates the Feast of Tabernacles, they're supposed to bring in tithing. They're supposed to bring in an offering. And so Abraham is doing just that by bringing in an offering to honor the Lord during this Feast of Tabernacles. He is not commanded to do so. Um, but this is the uh, this is the mantra of the feast. This is what you do. You go in to celebrate the fact that the Lord uh, blessed the land so that you can have it. Uh, and you're going there to bless him who made it possible. And you had the sodomites on this side saying, no, let's do it like this. And Abraham said, no, this is the way it was going to be done. We're going to give unto the Lord through uh, Melchizedek, so to speak. And uh, when you move further on from that scripture, then you see God coming up against Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, the same cities that was rescued. Uh, he comes up against them and destroys them, except Zoar, because that's where Lot ran into. And so what does that tell you? That tells you this. If you look at it like a timeline, you have the Battle of Armageddon which is a type and shadow of the battle of the kings that takes place. You have the Melchizedek showing up was a type and shadow of the second coming of Christ. And when he comes, he establishes the millennial reign of Christ and ushers in the feast of tabernacles where uh, bread and wine is, is served. Um, there is a sacrifice that has to be offered daily during the uh, feast of tabernacles, which is typed the tenth that Abram gave unto Melchizedek. And after that, you had uh, the destruction of the cities of the plain, which is typed in what was what's going to happen at the end of the millennial reign when Satan is loosed and he's going to go about to tempt the living nations, not those that have been deemed righteous, but their children, because everybody who's who uh, who's born on earth has to be tempted, has to be tested you know, whether they will follow God or not. And he's going to find that many will not. And so that's where you see the fire raining down in heaven, which is tight in the destruction of the cities of the five plains. But yet even through that, there will be some who will make it through like Lot. And then you will usher in the great white throne judgment. But there will be sympathizers like Lot's wife uh, who will be destroyed in the uh, flames that come down from heaven. Um, during the earth's fire baptism. So what I'm basically saying is this, that the tithing that has been represented in using Melchizedek uh, as the, uh, as justification for modern day saints to, uh, to pay the 10th, um, you know, um, is, I, my personal belief is, is been misinterpreted that uh, when you see Melchizedek on the scene, it is a representation of, um, uh, of a type of Feast of Tabernacles that takes place. And, uh, you know, again, when you read that scripture, in nowhere do you see Melchizedek giving the order that you got to pay tithes unto me. Um, this was a free will offering. Um, you know, this was done out of the out of out of uh, the the love that a person has towards the Lord. Tithing does exist, but not in the bully style uh, manner that a lot of uh, of saints are 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 bringing upon the heads of people. It is not done that way um, because uh, you know even when you read, and I'm going to cut it short now so I can let my brother. Uh, speak, uh, praise the Lord, but it does speak about how, uh, you know, when tithing was given by the Levites, it was done by commandments. But now the Lord established a New Testament, which is done by an oath. And so we are no longer under the commandments 
uh, but rather we are done. We are, we are now living by the promise of God that He will do this, that, and the other. Um, and so we do offer unto the Lord our entire person because we do have to present ourselves as a living sacrifice unto Him on a daily basis. And in doing so, yes, you're going to offer uh, the best that you have. And so tithing does exist, but not under the uh, the bully system uh, that a lot of uh, those who believe otherwise uh, have uh, have taught. Amen. So I'll turn it over to Stanley's hand, uh, Deacon Holmes' hand. Praise the Lord. Uh, Stanley works. I don't have a problem. You don't have to call me by my superhero name. Um, <laughs> what I'm going to... I just, just had a quick question. To... Okay, we're trying to get into this. I just, Go ahead. I, I just had a quick question. Does the New Testament speak of tithing? Well, if you give me a second, we're going to get into that. Give me a second. Okay, dealing with Mount Chesnick, and we're going to get into that question. Dealing with Mount Chesnick, again, that was not money Abraham even gave from his own personal finances. It's like going down and playing the slot machine in Atlantic City and giving somebody a tenth of that. That wasn't even from his own personal money or his own personal savings account because he then gave 90 percent to the kings so we're talking about money that was given from the spoils of war when you look at mount chesnick in the new testament the only reason uh you have the account in the uh the reason this old testament story is recounted in the new testament is because it compares which is hebrews chapter 7 verse 8 because it compared the old covenant priesthood with the new here's the logic Abraham, representing Levi, pays respect to Mount Chesnick, representing Christ. This means that Abraham is lesser and Mount Chesnick is greater, which means Levi is lesser and Christ is greater. This in turn means that the old covenant is lesser and the new covenant is greater. This is the one and only reason for recounting the story. There is no instruction in Hebrews 7 for a Christian to give a certain percentage of their income today. Okay? If we go by what's in the Old Testament, which was commanded... OK, you have the Levitical or sacrificial tithe, which is Numbers chapter 18, verse 21, verse 24. You have the tithe of the feast, Deuteronomy chapter 14, 22 to 27. And then you have the tithe for the poor, which is Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29. All tithing came from the land. This story, uh, the people didn't have money because we had it all the time. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Can you repeat those scriptures? You you went too fast. Can you slow okay, down? Okay, okay, okay. Not Thank a problem. Because I tend to talk fast. Okay, the Levitical or sacred tithe is Numbers 18, 21 to 24. The Levitical or sacred tithe, Numbers 18, 21 to 24. The tithe of the feast, Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 27. The type of the feast, Deuteronomy chapter 14, 22 to 27. Then we have the type for the poor, Deuteronomy 14, 28 and 29. And again, people always say, well, you know, today we give money. If you look at Genesis, it mentions money 32 times in Genesis. They had money back then. But the tithing was done from the land, which Aldo Bonet talked about, the tithing from the land. And again, this was Old Testament. Okay, this is what the law was. And you didn't really give 10% altogether. You actually gave 23%. And I know um, I, I was speaking with my brother, uh, Deacon Davis. He said 23.2. But again, altogether, this is what you gave and it gave from the land. If you use the Old Testament type what the Catholic Church uses, once again, you have to give one third to the poor, one third to the widow indeed, and then the priest didn't own anything. What the priest had came from the church and they gave them a stipend for their clothing, their food, their food and where they live. Now, like uh, Brother Jones asked me, is it mentioned in New Testament? Well, let me give you this. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of men and anise and cumin and have a minute the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have done and not to leave the other undone. So 
what about worrying more about people and spiritual things? The New Testament does not prescribe tithing. Okay, they do give money. In fact, Jesus explicitly calls tithing a matter of the law, which we just talked about. And Christians are not under the law, which is Romans 6 and 14, Galatians 5 and 18. Okay, so again, no one is saying don't give money because you live in a house, you eat food, you wear clothing, all of this costs money, the church needs money. But like Elder Bonet said, which I'm 100% with, the bullying tactic. Let's take a look at something everybody likes to ignore. It is right in front of your face in the New Testament. Verse chapter, chapter 2 of Acts, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise unto you and to your children, and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord of God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from his untoward generation. And then they had gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So now the Holy Ghost is coming. Ooh, the Holy Ghost is here, is working on the people. So what is God doing here? Let's jump to verse 45, which everyone loves to ignore. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So it's showing here it's a free will offering. After the church opened up, you do not hear them saying give 10, 15, 20. It's a free will offering and they gave more than 10, 15 and 20 percent. But it was still free will. Now, y'all saying, oh, Stanley, you got that wrong. Let's go to Acts chapter four. And look at verse 32 to 35. Let's see. Yep, 32 to 35. Acts chapter 4. Let's see what it says again in the New Testament church. Here you go, Brother Robert. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common, which we just read, Acts 2.45. And with great power gave the apostle witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of the lands or houses sold them and brought the price of things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles feet and distribution was made unto every man according to as he had need. So once again, I'm sorry, tithing's not there. It was a free will and they gave more than 10 and 15%, but it was still free will. Let's prove this again. Let's look at Acts chapter five. And a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why have Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart that thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came among all of them that heard these things. But once again, this is Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, showing you again what they actually did in the Bible. You never heard Peter say, the chief apostle, you owe me 10%. You owe me this percent. He said, while it was yours, it was yours to do what you want. You dropped dead because you lied. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse seven. Every man according as his purpose in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity for God love of a cheerful giver. How can you be a cheerful giver if people are telling you that if you don't give, that Dracula is in the kitchen, Freddy Cougar's in the closet, and Jesus Christ himself is under the bed with a 12-inch knife ready to cut your throat. You can't be a cheerful giver if people are threatening you and telling you if you don't do this, God is going to get you. Now and again, we're going to use scripture, not opinion. And what they love to use, because the last time we had this conversation, they said we're not going to go Old Testament, but then they did go Old Testament after they used Mount Chesnick outside of the Old Testament to use the bully tactic like Elder Bonet said. And here we have 
Malachi. Now, now, first, we're going to do what I hear people like to use all the time to sound intelligent. And they like to say we're going to exegesis and we go to exegesis and all that type of stuff. But we're going to exegesis. Now, what does exegesis mean? Because I'm not interested in sounding intelligent to anybody on the line. So I'm going to tell you what exegesis actually means. It means we're going to follow scripture. OK, we're following scripture. Exegesis means you're following your own logic. So now we're going to read scripture so we can know exactly what God was saying and who he was talking to in Malachi that's used on us every day. Let's read what the Bible says. Malachi chapter one, verse six. And a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name, and ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Now that's Malachi chapter one, verse six. He said, O priest, let's go to Malachi chapter two. Verse one, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. Okay, once again, we're establishing, we're exegesis and now, we're using scripture, we're talking about the priests. Let's get back to chapter three, verse three. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. Let's say that again. Purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So once again, we have now established exegesis. We have established, okay, chapter one, Malachi verse six, chapter two, Malachi verse one, chapter three, verse three, Malachi. We're talking about the Levitical priest. What does he have to say? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. What is he talking about? He's talking about the priest. We have established it. He's not talking about me. He's not talking about Rob. He's not talking about Michael, Michelle, and Vicky. He's talking about the priest who was over the finances of Israel, who was getting that 23%. And instead of him using one third for the poor, one third for the widow indeed, and using what was supposed to be his stipend, he was robbing the storehouse. Now, let me break it down for y'all who might still be confused. It's like having a husband, a wife, and a child. The husband is the breadwinner. He's taking the money that's coming in the house and he's running across town where he caught a couple of baby mamas and got himself some silk underwear, some silk suits. And the household he's supposed to be over is broke. And meanwhile, the people are looking at the wife and the son, but it's not the wife and the son while that household is poor and cursed. The reason the household is poor and cursed because the husband man is a crook and a robber. So you can't turn around and blame the wife. You can't blame the child. Who well, being blamed in this chapter is the priest who's the crook. And you can't say what I say to one, I say to all. That's not Amen. true. He's Amen. talking to the crooked priest. So the you name, can't go outside, you can't go outside the scripture and use Mount Chesnick, which doesn't have nothing to do with anything, then <laughs> jump back into the old testament and then scare me with Malachi that's talking about the preacher, which we just proved. And then, like I said, we look at the New Testament, we do give money. The church cannot live on love. I don't live on love. If I lived on love, I'd be a poor man. I'd be out in the street. I'd be out in the street rubbing a cat someplace with a sign, we'll work for food if I lived on love. So that's not what we're saying. But we're just saying stop threatening and boogeyman people. Give what you can give. There's nothing wrong with the preacher saying to the people, hey, I would like for y'all to give 10% because I know nobody's going to sell the house. And I sure know nobody's going to open up their savings account and split it with the guy who works at Dunkin' Donuts. Let's be real. I'm not doing it. So I don't have a problem with the pastor saying, hey, we got these bills. We got things that need to be done. Can you give 10 percent? And some of y'all can afford to give more than 15 or 20 percent. The only thing we simply said, like Elder Bonet said, is the bully tactic of the threat. And we have some saints who are eating cat food. And please don't say, well, I always pay my tithe. I know people ain't never paid no tithe, okay? <clears throat> Hugh Hefner, who was in the Playboy Mansion, wasn't thinking about Christ, and he lived very, very well. That's, <laughs> not, what That's not what we're talking about here. We're simply just talking about telling people the truth, being honest with people, not bullying people, and I would like that. I'm going to end it myself here because I have some other people who have some uh, thoughts. I have, I have Brother Andre Keenan, who is a deacon big. over in Washington, D.C. I'm going to turn it over to him. Deacon right. Holmes? Yes, yes. 
Well, you turn it into Andre Keenan. I, mm -hmm. I think maybe someone may have something to say. Anyone have something to say before you turn it over to someone else? Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord, Mother Beth. I just have one scripture I would like from uh, Elder Mobay. Elder, Elder, Elder. <laughs> Elder Bonet. <laughs> Elder Bonet or uh, Deacon Holm. Will you explain? I uh, read first the twenty third Matthew twenty three twenty three. They already did that. Matthew 22, 23? Um, we did 22 to 23, where God is talking about the people who are worrying more because he's talking to the Jews, where they're worrying more about paying tithes than their moral obligation. It's more than just that. Because at the time, we do know Jesus was still talking with Jewish people who were following Jewish customs. But once the church was opened up, like I said, if you look at Acts 2.45, which nobody wants to talk about, which free will, and then you do have uh, chapter four of Acts, 32 to 35, which also talks about the free will offering everybody was given. And once again, I'm not telling anybody not to pay tithes or offering if that's what you want to do. And I told you, I got no problem with the preacher saying, hey, we can't live on love. I got no issue with that either. The only thing I'm saying, Mother Betts, is please stop saying Count Dracula's in the kitchen, Freddy Cougar's in the closet, and Jesus underneath my bed with a bowie knife to cut my throat. And I've heard some pastors say you're going to go to hell. So just some of this stuff is just a little bit too drastic. And that's all I'm saying. God know what you can give and what you can't give. And let me say this real quick before I turn it over to Deacon Keenan to give you an example. I had somebody who called me because I had a conversation with somebody and they were telling me I need to put my, uh, what do you call it, cash app out there. I'm doing so much work, you need to get some money. And I told them I do this work not for money. Everybody know the hard work I do in my teachings. If they want to ask me to put my cash out there because they want to bless me, I have no problem. But I'm not going to get on the cash app fit. I'm not doing this and be one of those guys who's a, a hustler. I'm not hustling the gospel. And what? God had somebody call me on the phone and tell me, hallelujah, God been pressing on my heart to bless somebody who don't got no money. And they found me worthy and trustworthy. Said, God gave me your name. Find somebody who can't pay too much rent. Tell me what their two months rent is, and I'm going to give you the money to give them the bless. And hallelujah, I was so happy to get that money for that person, and the person might even be on the line, and I sent that person the money. You don't have to be a crook. And after that, they turned around and blessed me. So I'm just saying, you can do the right thing and just be honest with people and tell people what the real deal is. Right. You don't have to do the boogeyman tactic. That's right. all I'm saying. I'm not saying don't pay. Because I, if I don't pay, I'll be on the street. Uh, go ahead, Dickens Keenan. We got more questions before Deacon um, Keeney comes. Okay. You want him to okay. speak first? I'll, I'll take the question. I, 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 did, yeah, well, I just want to give him some time to talk because he's the deacon and a trustee. So, you know, he knows some things. If, okay, can great. I, can, I have, can I have one thing really quick? I apologize. But uh, since you were on Acts, if you read Acts 15, 22 to 28, it speaks of the apostolic doctrine. And so at the Jerusalem Council, the first council that took place with the church, uh, they came together to try to figure out how are they going to integrate the Gentiles within the church? Because, right. the, you know, at the issue at the time was legalism. And, you know, uh, you know, the Jew, Jewish Christians were wondering, hey, you know, they were saying we need to keep the law and grace. Paul said no. So at the conclusion of the council, they reasoned this, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm about to read. And they sent this by the hands of Paul and Silas unto the Gentile churches that existed at that time. And so it reads this. It says, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, uh, namely Judas, surnamed Barnabas, and Silas, chief men of the brethren, among the brethren. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So these are the necessary things Amen. that the church, that the church said that we, as the modern day church, if we're following the apostolic doctrine, these are the necessary things that we're supposed to follow. It says this, verse 29, that you are to abstain from meats offered unto idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fear ye well. They ended it right there. And in no account in their list here do they say that, do they include ties? Amen right? to that. Uh, okay, can can Deacon Keenan speak? Because I did ask him to come on, and we also had Deacon Davis. I just like to hear what they have to say. Amen. Go ahead, Deacon Keenan. Uh, <clears throat> praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, praise, 
I don't know about anybody else, but I, I just have joy bells ringing in my soul right now. Uh, I'm just so happy to hear this sound doctrine being taught, the word of God, you know, coming forth uh, on this Zoom meeting. Um, and I, I was I was smiling um, as I was listening to Deacon Holmes and Elder Bonet expound upon the word of God. And I was listening to, you know, what they were saying about tithing and um you know, and about giving. And one of the things that came to me um, as they were talking, he said, the Lord, um, in, in Malachi, he did say, he said, uh, and prove me now herewith, yeah. saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, uh, we talk about, uh, giving and the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And when we give, you know, I, I was thinking about what they were saying um, earlier about uh, the bullying uh, tactics. And I can, I can um, remember growing up, you know, my dad, he came from a family of, of uh, nine boys and three girls. And I can remember, you know, all of them um, growing up in the church, being baptized in Jesus name. And and a number of them were filled with the Holy Ghost. And over the years, I watched a lot of them. They they began to back away from the church. And and uh, even my dad for a while, he had backed away. And one day I sat down with him as I got older and I asked him, I said, what is it? He and my uncle um, at the time he was lived. My uncle was living in. Um, in Pelham, New York. And um, we sat down and we were talking and I said, I asked him, I said, why did you, why did you stop going to church? Why did you stop serving in the church? I said, because at one time, all of you were strong in the faith and you were working. And they started talking about some of the very things I've been hearing here tonight. Uh, there were churches that had become so obsessed with tithing and giving that they were asking, they were actually asking members when they would join for a copy of their um, mm -hmm. the W two forms, so that they could see how much money they were earning, to tell them how much they should be paying in their ties. And it it got to the point where, and I, I'm so glad. I think Elder Bonet and Deacon Holmes um, touched on this. Uh, in when when they were talking about the priest and how his house was being neglected because he was taking the funds and he was going elsewhere. And I, I can recall uh, during that time period that, um, you know, a lot of my like I said, my uncles, they they got turned off from the church because they were seeing a lot of these, you know, these tactics that these pastors were using to to force people to give. And and I did say force because it, to me, when the people were giving in the offering, I used to hear a lot of complaining. Uh, and and I was saying, well, now I'm reading the scripture. It said the Lord loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> he loveth a cheerful giver. But the people, you know, when I heard about the, the pastors asking for the W-2s, you know, and, and I, I was reading the scriptures for myself. And as the Lord began to mature me, and and help me understand these scriptures, you know, the, it's it's what you purpose in your heart to give, and the Lord will deal with you about that. It's a it's an individual thing. Um, uh, what I what I was looking at, um, as as uh, Elder Holmes was was speaking, he was talking about um the people um, and if, I think it's in the book of Matthew. Let me go back and check my reference. Uh. Excuse me. I think I was looking in the book of uh, Matthew. Just a second. Yes, we see that. He got cut off. Okay. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. I'm sorry. I was trying to find my notes. Um, so there's a reference to, and, and I, I, I was thinking about, um, they were talking about how a lot of times, even in giving how you, uh, 
you sort of put people on the spot and you announce. And I've been in several congregations where they will announce what individuals are, are giving in the offering. And one thing I found in Matthew's uh, chapter 23. Um, let me see. Verse 23, what we talked about. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I started, I was writing my notes down as you guys were talking, uh, it, starting with uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse number 7. It says, every man according to his, he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Okay, that was the first one I found. And then it was another scripture that I had come across. Um, Oh, Matthew chapter six, verses, verse number one. And it says, uh, take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Amen. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your father, which is in heaven, you know, to be seen of men. And, and I can recall over the years being in services, whether they were local services or 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 um international services and and the, the preacher would get up and he would he would um the man of god would have the people stand up that were giving certain amounts of money and mm -hmm. i wanted to ask a question about that tonight because uh we're on the since we're in in um we're talking about giving um uh, in that chapter where he was he was telling them you're giving alms to be seen of men uh but what re where is your reward? Where is your reward? Is your reward going to be from man or is it coming from God? When you stand up and you do this mm -hmm. because you're uh, you're so, doing it. You understand what I'm trying to say? I'm sorry. I'm a little tired. To say. You guys, please excuse me. <laughs> are you trying to say we can't do the hundred and five hundred dollar prayer line? What are you, are you talking about? Dick and Canaan? We, we can't well, do that. <laughs> I, you know. This this is one thing I, I can recall. I remember one of my uncles saying to me that he got really he got really vexed one time. He was at a convocation and it, don't worry, it wasn't cool. J.C. Uh, he was <laughs> he was at another convocation and the, the speaker of the evening was actually calling people up, um, you know, in those lines to pay this and to pay that. And yes, yeah, some people, they stepped out on faith and they gave. And uh, the Lord blessed them. Mm -hmm. But there was one person that that stood up and, you know, they literally had their utility bill money and they paid that. And they went up and, and they they uh, they believed that God was going to, you know, make a way for them. And my uncle saw this and he recalls having to send that same person money that week because their electricity was turned off <laughs> and that is in, in, in sense that turned him off. Mm. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't like to talk about these things, but it happens. I mean, uh, I can recall this same in this same ministry, people were literally cashing in their food stamps. Mm. They mm. would cash their food stamps in uh, because they felt like, well, I don't have anything to give. So I'm just going to give what I have in my purse and, you know, it's it's funny you were talking about the bullying tactics. You know, I, I am a firm believer in giving unto the Lord. Uh, and and, and I'm, a, I'm also a believer that he will pour out uh, blessings that we won't have room enough to receive because he's done it for me. And, and he does want us to try him and to prove him, Amen. not because he wants us to be seen of men, but he wants he wants to be glorified so that we can say, look at what the Lord the people will see uh, the good works and glorify our father, not glorify me, but glorify God. You know, in our giving, we're, we're doing this. You know, it is an act of faith. We're doing it because we love the Lord. Amen. But at the same time, we're doing it because we are proving him. And and that's what that's what stuck out in my mind as, as uh, I was listening this evening. You know, we we are doing this to prove him that. And he said, try me. Try me and see. Amen. That's what he told us to do. Uh, as far as is as working in the office. Yes, I, I've been working in the deacons and trustees office for quite some time. 
And uh, one of the things I I asked the Lord to to put in me to to put in me a mind to want to please Him, and and not just not just in word and deed, but even in my giving. I mm-hmm. want it to be done in the right spirit, not because this person told me or like like uh, uh, Elder Bonet said, bullied me into paying this certain amount of money, but I pay, I, I pay my tithes and, and offering because I love the Lord and he Amen. has been good to me. And, and it is, it is very clear to me that, you know, because we are living under grace, that's the kind of giver that God wants. He doesn't want me giving out of obligation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because that, you know, that to me, you become grudging and you begin to complain. A- Amen. And that's not a cheerful giver, is it? No, it is not. So, so when you're scaring people and bullying them, are you actually being cheerful? You're under obligation. I, I know we have Deacon Davis. I, I don't know if he wants to say anything. You have anything you'd like to say, Deacon Davis? Okay, I hear silence. So maybe he doesn't have anything he wants to add. Well, to Elder, Hol- um, um, Minister, um, I'm sorry, Deacon Holmes. Oh. Also wanted to add this too. I, one of the things I was, I was looking at the history of the Pentecostal movement in America. And if you go back and you look at the Azusa mission, do you mm. know, a lot of, a, a lot of those, especially William Seymour and, and the evangelists and the, and, and the men of God that worked along with him, a lot of times when they would have services at the Azusa mission, they didn't even um, stand up and call for an offering. They, they would actually have collection plates on the walls in the side mm-hmm. of the, the church. And the people would actually go over to the collection plate during service as the spirit moved on them. Amen. And they would put the money in those collection plates. And they said some nights, and this was at the turn of the 20th century, uh, there were some nights they would come out of there with over a thousand dollars. Amen. And, and and that's the moving of the spirit as we saw in Acts 245, right. where people were moved to split all this stuff, and in Acts chapter four. So the Holy Ghost will, like I said, somebody gave me three thousand dollars just to give somebody who don't have, and then bless yeah. me too. So the Holy Ghost can do this work. You don't have to sit here with Frankenstein, Wolfman, and Dracula. You don't have no. to do any of that stuff. And all you got to do is tell the truth. I mean, think about this for a second. If I'm just talking and over my big mouth, I'm charging all this money. Imagine if God let me lay hands on somebody and somebody say, imagine if the lame would walk. How much money would I charge then? Y'all probably couldn't afford me if God used me to actually do something besides run my big mouth. So this is why sometimes yeah. we don't even get a chance to see some of the miracles because we can't handle it. We can't even handle it. We make it about something that God says is not. And that's not saying, because I think Brother Arnie was very intent on saying he pays. I, I just gave money. It's not, we're saying don't give money, but give unto God and don't bully nobody. Give out the spirit of the Lord and let's not jump around all these scriptures to try to make something that is not. Because some people, all they're about is money. Because if you look in the uh, Bible Britannica, it tells you where the tithing was instituted in New Testament church. The Catholics did it because they yeah. didn't trust nobody. They didn't want no free will offering. They say have faith and believe. And then they instituted a hard tithing tax on people because they wanted to get that money. And then even yeah. in the Bible, in chapter six, and I'm going to go here, chapter six, it said, choose seven men. Make yeah. them deacons. Put them over the money. Hallelujah. I don't want to be bothered with this filthy lucre. I want to spend my time in prayer and studying the word. That's what the apostle said. How we wind up with a trustee board. And now the money's away from the deacons. And now the trustee board are making financial decisions. The deacons just counting the money. And then I know where preachers, when they didn't like what was going on, they fired that trustee board. You can't fire deacons, but you can fire the trustee board. So once again, the apostles went away from the money. And then we see now today's church, some of the preachers put themselves back over the money and made a trustee board that they could control. Now, I'm not saying everybody, but you do see it. And this is what turning a lot of people off. It's turning a lot of people off. And we don't have to do that. Deacon Holmes? Yes. Deacon, Deacon I'll praise the Lord. If you could go to the chat, we have four questions in the chat. Could you read them for me, please? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, was it only money that he tithes and is money the only acceptable form of tithes and offering? That's the first question. OK, let me deal with that first one, because I did say earlier, but I do have a, a habit of talking like Ricky Ricardo sometimes in the Old Testament. 
it really, if you check it out, they were tithing with the land, people who dealt with the land. That was the tithing system that was actually done in the Old Testament. It was not money. And then you hear this untruth, this canard, fancy word for saying lying, is they say, but well, they didn't have money back then. Like I said, 32 times money is mentioned in Genesis, so they did have money. But again, it wasn't about all the money. It was the land. So that's what they were actually doing in the Old Testament. They were tithing off the land. I know in the um, in the New Testament, um, they were talking about uh, the giving of alms. Mm -hmm. um, and, and alms can be both money and it can also be food provided for the poor. Um, you know, uh, yeah, but I, that's I can one recall. Thing that's important. Very important. Old and new, take care of the poor. Do we yeah. have money that we definitely put aside for the poor? That's why a lot of people don't want to actually go into the Catholic Old Testament system because then mm -hmm. you're going to be locked in and taking care of that poor and taking care of that widow. That's why some of us went to Mount Chesnick and became super Jesus. So that way, nobody uh, could tell me I got to pay you anything except what I want to do. But, you know, my grandmother, my grandmother was a, a mother in the church. And and I, I can recall she she was, you know, and I used to hear my father talk about it all the time. She she would be in that kitchen and a lot of times she would be cooking. And she would cook for some of the other mothers um, in the church. Uh, her her specialty, she baked cakes. She was always baking cakes for, you know, the other mothers or, or the less fortunate that were in the church, you know, or, or you know, I mean, in, within the congregation. So they, she gave and, and, you know, I thought about that giving of alms. That is giving of alms when you're when you're using your resources. And you're you're baking and you're cooking and, Amen. and or you're going over and you're giving of yourself teaching, you know, you're, you're, you're going over there. Someone, you know, you know, your brother, or your sister is sick and you go over and, and you're taking care, helping them take care of the house. If, if their grass needs to be cut yard, you know, those that that to me, that's giving of alms. You're helping those who are in need. And, and that 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 sounds a lot like the New Testament church. They gave to such as had need. Amen. You know, whatever resource you have is available. Uh, uh, just second question is, we're going to have Elder Bonet come in and ask, answer a question as well. Elder mm -hmm. Bonet, at what point did tithes and offerings only become money? Uh, praise the Lord. So uh, we can reason that the, as we had said earlier, that the tithes were primarily about, um, you know, bringing the increase of the land and giving a tenth of that over to the house of God, um, of which the Lord then took and gave a portion of it to the Levites. But then when that was no longer um, an issue, such as when, um, uh, let's say, like when the church, when it comes into play, you know, they sold their possessions, you know, they didn't have all of these things anymore, you know, and uh, we know that money was an issue, coinage, and or rather money was around during that time, because remember, the Lord uh, told Peter to go and to pull out a fish and then, you know, uh, there was a coin in his mouth and he was supposed to take it to help, you know, uh, pay uh, what was supposed to go to Caesar between him and and, and Jesus. Um, so, you know, when uh, it moved into the church and there was no longer an issue with land, um, you know, because they sold their possessions, then, you know, it was whatever they had uh, that they divided amongst each other. Um, you know, Paul would even go around doing his earthly mis ministry, uh, missionary journeys, and then he would start collecting, you know, for the poor uh, of the church. And um, so uh, coinage began to come into play likely around that that part when, you know, uh, when it was no longer about, uh, you know, the tribe's lands. Uh, and that was the, it was the church, you know, because you also have to remember, too, when Jesus, when uh, Peter witnessed on in Acts chapter two, 3,000 souls came in, many of them were from the diaspora, many of them were from other lands, the Jews from other lands who came in to celebrate Pentecost during that time. And they took the word of God back with them, you know. Um, so they didn't have land from uh, Israel that they possessed or anything like that. They just had whatever they had, wherever they lived. Um, and so it just slowly came into play, likely as the Old Testament uh, began to move away and then the New Testament uh, came in. Amen. Um, we have four questions come from one person, but I don't want to go through all that one person questions because there may be someone else on the line that may want to ask a question. Anyone else have a question or concern when it comes to tithes? Anyone else?
You can unmute yourself. If not, we're going to go th to the third question. Um, do we follow Melchizedek or Jesus? Did Jesus tie? I'll, let me, I'll, I'll listen to that one. Uh, praise the Lord. Okay. So um, we follow Jesus. Uh, for there's no other name under heaven given whereby a man can be saved. Um, when it speaks of Melchizedek, uh, Jesus is coming in the order of Melchizedek. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, there were those such as Moses who did want to see the face of God, but could not. Why? Because, you know, it, it just wasn't time for that. And also uh, there were those who wanted to know his name. There wasn't time for that. But yet this was still Jesus. And so uh, when you speak about somebody who uh, has no birth and no descent and all of these and is the priest of the most high God, you're speaking about the Lord God Almighty. You're speaking about Jesus Christ. It's just that in the Old Testament, he could not be revealed as Jesus at that time because then uh, the name for salvation would have been revealed. But it just wasn't time yet. And so we do follow Jesus. He is. Uh, coming, he does come after the order of Melchizedek, of which he did appear in the Old Testament as. And do, did Jesus tithe? Um, yes, he had to have tithed because uh, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ began in the law. Right. Uh, so he would have had to follow the law in order to be the, uh, and keep the law in order to be the perfect sacrifice for all of us. Correct, correct. And one thing correct. I want to say about those who want to follow the order of Melchizedek, go have a war. And then give 10% of your spoil of war because that's what was actually given by Abraham. He did not give of his own. He gave 10% of the spoils of war. We have to remember that as well. And then he gave the other 90% to the Solomon um, Gomorrah kings. Okay, so we have to somehow understand why are we running to Mount Chesnick and not even using what was in the Old Testament law? Because that way I don't have to follow the commandments of the law, which would make the Levitical priest which some preachers call themselves, they had to pay one third of the poor, one third to the widow indeed, and then they couldn't own no car and house in their name. So now I jump to Mount Chesnick, who was a form of Christ. No offense, ain't no preacher no form of Christ. Ain't none of us here can say we're a form of Christ. We ain't no, no Christ now. So you got to watch what some of this stuff is saying. Does it even make sense? So you jump out the law and then jump to Malachi, which is the law when you want to scare people. Think about it, folks. Think about it. Number four. How important are spiritual sacrifices over material sacrifices? How important are spiritual sacrifices over material sacrifices? James James speaks about it and says that you know uh, you know it's not enough just to bless your brother and and just give him his give him your blessing when you see that he has a a, a material need uh, for him as well. Um, and so, you know, you want to make sure that you uh, not just bless them, if you can afford to bless them spiritually and you can afford them best materially, then you do that. Um, Jesus spoke about the um, uh, the story of the um, um, uh, the oh, gosh, I'm thinking of the, um, uh, the story with the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan. And so, uh, you know, the Lord speaks about how you had this good Samaritan who went out his way to help some help, uh, you know, someone from the from the land, from uh, from Israel. Um, you had somebody who was an enemy to Israel helping him and going all out his way and putting out money and things like that. The Lord is about um, uh, love. And if you love the Lord more than these, then, you know, as you love, you're going to give of the best that you have as a parent. You know, uh, you know, we do our best to give our kids what they need to have to thrive thereby. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. We just go out of our way to make sure that they are supplied. And the uh, age of grace is it, is it's just enveloped in love, you know, because Jesus said, it. he said, look, if you're going to follow me, you have to honor the two great commandments, which pretty much surmises all of the commandments, which is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. If you love, then you are going to give. You're going to see a need. You're going to see a need spiritually, and you're going to supply that need, and you're going to see a need naturally if it's there, and you're going to supply that need. Remember, Jesus, when he went about healing people, he healed them. Let's just take Mary Mag Magdalene, for instance. He, uh, she had, I believe, it was seven devils inside of her. He cast out the devils and then tells her, go and sin no more. You know, So he took care of her. Uh, uh, you know, on one level spiritually, but then he continues to um, uh, supply for her, you know, um, 
you know, on a uh, on a natural level. You know, he took care of her insides and he takes care of her outsides. When you look at the temple, inside the temple, you have the golden candlestick, which represents the light of God, the spiritual, uh, the light of the rather the Holy Ghost. And on the other side, you had the table of showbread, which uh, had the 12, uh, you know, um, uh, unleavened breads, which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. What that's telling you is that God will supply and we're priests inside of there. We work in there in that same area. That's where the priest dwelt. And so inside of there, the Lord is supplying our spiritual needs in the light of the Holy Ghost, as well as our natural needs in the bread of the of the unleavened bread that was supplied there. And so we have to do the same thing, especially after we're made in his image and likeness. So if you see somebody who has a natural need and you have the means to help, then you help. And how are you helping? You're helping because you love them. If you see somebody who has a spiritual need, uh, mm -hmm. praise the Lord. You say something. You, you, you. If the Lord gave you a, a a revelation about His 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 gospel, you share it. You know that's supplying their spiritual need, and this is all about love. Amen. I think Amen. someone had a question. Someone had a question. No, just just trying to say what he also said. Mother Betts mentioned when you read Matthew the twenty third verse, I believe the 20, 23rd chapter. It says in there when he, when Jesus talking to the Pharisees. <clears throat> Y'all worrying about all this money, 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 money. Some of us got a bunch of money. We write a check in a heartbeat. But let somebody tell you to go give somebody some, some help somebody out. Go clean somebody's house today too sick. Go give somebody communion. You'll write a check before you visit somebody at a hospital. That's what Jesus was talking about in 2023, 20, 23. It's not all about this money. We made it all about this money. That's what we've done with the $100, $200 prayer line and some of the stuff we've done. And like I said before, we say we're apostolic. <laughs> And a lot of things we're doing is an apostolic. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. I really enjoyed this teaching tonight. I hope everyone receives something from tonight's teaching. If you didn't understand something tonight, please reach out to the panelists and um, you could talk to them. Um, panelists, is can we get a copy of this recording or we're not sending out recordings? You guys speak to Elbow now. It has been reported, if uh, and I believe it was recorded to the cloud. If it's going to the cloud, then we have it set up so that nobody's names will be shown. So that's we should be fine. We can send this out. Okay. okay. And one more thing. One more thing before we cut off. Sure. We did not tell anybody not to pay tithes and offering. Y'all can get fifty percent of your income. We do not care. We're only saying to those in power, take care of my little ones. Stop threatening and scaring people that Jesus is outside with his gang called the angels on his Harley with a baseball bat outside the church waiting for you. Please stop telling people that. Amen. There's, a, there's also a sad commentary when you see these rich preachers with all this money and their congregation is in need. It's, it's really sad. And, and so, thank you for, so. Keenan for coming on tonight. Thank you, Deacon Keenan. Thank you, Elder Bonet. And thank, thank you, Deacon Holmes. Again, if you want this recording, it is recorded. You can um, have the recording. Amen. At this time, we're going to have um, we're going to have Deacon Keenan close us out in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> you remember how to close out? Come on, Deacon Keenan. Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay, there we go. <laughs> I couldn't could get my unmute mute button to work. All right. Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, thank thank you so much uh, um, to Elder Bonet and to uh, Deacon Holmes. Uh, I have enjoyed this tremendously. This has been very enlightening uh, on so many levels. And we just Amen. thank God. Now let every heart pray. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this evening, Lord, just thanking you for this opportunity to get into your word. Lord, to learn more about you. Lord, you told us, glory to God, to try you and see Glory to God. We thank you right now, Lord, on tonight for blessing us through with this word, for feeding our souls. Lord, mm, that we may grow. Cool. Lord, that we may glorify your holy name. Lord, that your name may be lifted up. Lord, we praise you right now. Glory to God for the healing, Lord, that has taken place tonight. Lord, we realize, Lord, that your word brings healing. Lord, your word brings deliverance. Oh, Lord, and we thank you for the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Lord, we thank you right now, Lord, as, as we go forth 
into our several homes and destinations on tonight. We ask, Lord, that you continue, glory to God, to allow us to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. Lord, that your name may be magnified and glorified among the earth. Lord, because you're worthy of all the praise and all the glory. Lord, it belongs to you. Continue, glory to God. Lord, to lift up our leaders, Lord. Continue, glory to God. Lord, to encourage, glory to God, your the lay members and everyone, Lord, that are part of the faith, glory to God, that we continue to strive, Lord, to be the, the children of God that you want us to be. Lord, we want to make it in. We want to see your face. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask, Lord, that you have your way. Lord, touch our families, Lord, our co-workers, everyone, Lord, that's in our sphere of influence, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you have your way, Lord, and we'll ever give your name the praise, the glory, and all the honor. It belongs to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dick and Kingman. Appreciate it. Love you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you all for coming on. Love you too. Beautiful lesson. Beautiful. God bless you all. Enjoy let that. Put, let me put my Enjoy cash app out. Explaining. God bless you all. Be all. Good God bless you. 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 Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> no doubt. We'll Thank send you. it to your cash app. No doubt. No <laughs> doubt. Y'all yeah, have a wonderful night. That's the night. word of truth. Good night. Amen. Good night. Wonderful. Good night. Good night, everybody. Hey. I love you. <laughs> Good night. Big family. That's right. Elder Holmes. Big family. Elder Holmes. Yeah. We thank God for you all. Thank there was an excellent teaching and edifying the body of Christ. Thank God for you. God bless thank you. you. Thank All you right, for joining us, Brother Byron. Yeah, some of the preachers get their hands on us. We'll see. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I got you. I appreciate that. Right. Oh, you better run, better run, better run. Ah, uh, you better run. Better run, better run. Oh. Don't believe.